Hello, and welcome to the SciShow Talk Show, that day on SciShow, where we talk to interesting people about interesting things, and about half of our audience clicks on it, but the ones that do really have a good time. So thanks to all of you for watching. We're here today with Dr. Jeff Good of the Division of Biological Sciences at the University of Montana, who we have seen before. Uh, we talked to about rabbit domestications, because you get to study bunnies. Sometimes. Sometimes Some, bunnies. Sometimes other things. Sometimes other things. But are they all cute? They're all cute. Okay. Right now we They're have in the cute. back something cute. If you can hear that. I don't know if you can. Uh, a cute <laughs> thing that will be joining us later. But it's trying to dig its way out of a cage. Um, so, uh, last time we talked about rabbit domestication. And the marvelous and peculiar process that, uh, that that was. But that's sort of a side research project for you that you sort of stumbled into a little bit. That's right. So most of one of the major things in my lab, we, we study lots of different evolutionary processes. So we, we study how species come about, and we also study how species adapt to the environment. The domestication was kind of an interesting sideline on that, on how you know, humans adapt species to their own needs. Um, but in the, the major thrust of the research we're focused on right now is how um, species adapt to variable environments. And so, so that's sort of the story of all of evolutionary biology, though. That species is species adapt to variable environments. That's true. In, in particular, <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's what I do. <laughs> um, but the particular problem that we're interested in is in um, places like northern climates that are seasonally quite variable. I mean, seasonal variability is really common, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. in northern environments where you get really dramatic changes to seasonal environments, you can get very, you basically have to cope in some way. Mm -hmm. Some things migrate, some things hibernate. Some things basically stay active, but then have to cope in other ways. Mm -hmm. and so there's a suite of adaptations that have to go about to, to deal with these. And one of the things that we've become really interested in is animals that change color with the environments to maintain camouflage. Mm -hmm. So you are mostly studying uh, Arctic hares? or So we mostly study snowshoe hares. Snowshoe Arct hares. Arctic hares are a related species that okay. also does the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, we mostly study snowshoe hares, which um, are very widely distributed across North America. And um, they turn white every winter. Most populations turn white every winter. And then they turn brown again in the spring. Mm -hmm. And that generally tracks the on local onset of snow cover and mm -hmm. persistence of snow cover. So as a camouflage? As a camouflage thing. But the really fascinating thing is that that period you know, we live in Montana, as, as you know, you know, the snow can come early or come late, and mm -hmm. it can be a lot or a little, some years not at all. Um, that period of variability, it turns out, is really crucial for the hares. And so they're turning color to kind of track this general cue in the season changes, which is driven by how much daylight there is. So it's, so that's... That's, that's the trigger. It's that's not the, the trigger. temperature, it's yeah. not, it's really Mo how much most, daylight there is. Most seasonal changes are primarily driven by um, changes in how much light there is, so how okay. much, we call it photo period, but we'll just say how much daylight there is. Mm -hmm. And it, it triggers different hormones that trigger a suite of changes, so changes in whether or not you're reproducing, whether or not you're active, you know, whether or not you're choosing to migrate, things like that. In this case, the seasonal molt, which includes growing out new hair, not just changing the color in some cases, but also changing the insulation of the hair as well and the overall characteristics of the hair. So putting on that winter coat that you can think of, that you know, see a dog that puts on a really heavy winter coat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in this case, this is controlled by photo period and it's tied to color. And so s the, the daylight's the same every year, but some years there is right. very little snow. So you could take a hair and put it in a lab and like give it a daylight cycle and have it never change? Yeah, that's right, that's right. And so we actually have, we study two species that do this. We also study dwarf hamsters, which are another naturally seasonally changing species. So it's the only hamster that changes. It, it's hmm. um, native to Siberia. Would a, would a person who owns one of these hamsters have any idea that that would happen because they're keeping them in, inside all the time? Yeah, well, if they, if they don't you know, have them under constant light, then yeah. they will change. And okay. so if you go, there are domesticated um, versions of this. They're called Russian whites that if you have them on um, short days, usually less than 12 hours of daylight, then mm -hmm. what happens is they get this, um, this dose of a, of a hormone, melatonin, that actually makes them do this shift and then they'll, they'll turn white. Um, and depending on how consistent the light is and the darkness of the light, they'll, they'll turn all the way or not. Mm -hmm. If they get a lot of variation in light, they won't. 
But, um, and the same thing would be with the snowshoe hares. And there's other things that modify it, like temperature, but we don't really, the main thing is photo period. So it does have multiple inputs there. Yeah, multiple that's, inputs, primarily driven by. Light that light. sounds like a tough nut to crack. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so do you see, so you would then see uh, across a, uh, you know, the population more northern species. Um, if you took a more northern species and put it more southern, would it basically just, because the daylight period would have changed, would it, so like, is there, is there genetic variability yeah. there? That's, that's a great question, and we don't, we don't fully know the answer to all of that's part of what we're interested in mm -hmm. studying. We know that if you take extremes, so in some cases, so there's kind of two cool things. It's if to change color and when to change color. Mm -hmm. So snowshoe hares live across North America and all the way up from Alaska all the way down to here in Montana or you know, even further south. And so when you might want to change is, can be quite different along that mm -hmm. gradient. And also along the coast where for instance, you don't get as much snow cover. Mm -hmm. So the wind to change kind of tracks the north-south gradient and it's true things turn earlier, late and stay longer, um, stay white longer. Mm -hmm. And then further south that there's a gradient on that. We don't, the genetic basis of that is something we're really interested in and we're, we're trying to make inroads on that but it's kind of a tricky trait to study. Another cool thing is um, if to change, and that is, it has also a geographic pattern. So some species or some populations in snowshoe hares and also in other species that turn white have local populations that have lost the ability or you know, no longer turn white or you know, stay mm -hmm. brown all winter. And that usually occurs in places where snow cover is much more intermittent and mm -hmm. not, you know, doesn't persist. So coastal populations. Coastal areas. And yeah. so we're particularly interested in these populations of snowshoe hares that occur along the west coast of North America, mm -hmm. so into Washington, Oregon, and into BC. And in those, in those areas along the coast, they stay brown all year. And then in them, they turn white. And in the middle, there's a mixture of, of mm -hmm. hares that are white and brown in the winter. So it seems like there, it would be the kind of thing that would have a more minor change that would lead to yeah. a, a, a simpler change in the expression of the gene. So there are, we kind of distinguish between things that are big changes and little changes depending on how much they change, um, you know, the trait you're looking at. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's a pretty striking change. So it goes from white right. to brown. Mm -hmm. We think it has a simple basis, but it's a big change, right? right. So not always the big changes are not always many, many genetic changes. Right. And so they're kind of two separate questions and we're interested in both of them. But mm -hmm. um, we think that at least the if to turn is something that has a simple genetic basis and is controlled by one or two genes, we think, right now. And so, um, but whether or not that has to do with the, when and how those genes are turned on is mm -hmm. the question. So uh, one last thing here, if we're talking about this snowshoe hare population that isn't changing, mm -hmm. um, how, how might that, that you know, trait have have arisen. Like aside from the fact that the that yeah. the environment doesn't require it, um, and so maybe it's extra energy that doesn't need to be expended. But um, but how would that trait have even been like created or introduced? Right. So a, a simple scenario would be, you know, snowshoe hares living mostly in areas where they need to turn white, but then they colonize these coastal areas that where it's no longer a good thing to be a, a white hare in a brown in a brown world in the mm -hmm. in the winter. Yeah. And so um, new mutations arise, and those mutations influence the trait. And so the hairs that um, stay brown in the winter survive more, and, mm -hmm. and then that trait spreads locally and fixes. So that's kind of a new mutation scenario. Right. Um, another possibility that we're kind of int intrigued by is in this particular population that stays brown, it also shows a history of hybridization with um, a species of jackrabbit that's nearby. Mm -hmm. that um, doesn't turn colors in the winter. And it's possible that some of the genetic variants that um, underlie this trait come from the, the jackrabbits that don't turn in the winter. But that's, and that's, that might just sort of be a shortcut to getting there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would have come from mutation ultimately in, right. in the jackrabbit mm -hmm. as well. But the really interesting thing, and one reason we're really interested in the trait, is that the, it turns out that, that when the change really is going to probably matter under most models of climate change. So mm -hmm. it, the major, in temperate areas, we think about all the things that might happen with climate change. In temperate areas, the single largest um, 
trait that you see, environmental trait that you see associated with climate change and predicted um, shift is actually how much snow cover there is. It's not temperature and precipitation per se, but it's how mm -hmm. much actual snow cover there is on the ground with all the predictions being less and less. Right. And it turns out, at least local populations, so a colleague of mine, Scott Mills, who's at um, North Carolina State University, he's been studying snowshoe hares in Montana for 20 years, um, in this, in these, studying these population cycles. And what he's shown is that it turns out it's really, really bad news to be a either a brown hare in a white world mm -hmm. or a white hare in a brown world, and it, it dramatically drops their, their mortality or their, their survival through a lot of predation. I mean, everything eats hares. Right. That's pretty much how they die. No, no, no hair dies of old age. <laughs> and they pretty much get eaten. And yeah. they get eaten a lot when they're the wrong color. And mm -hmm. so the amount of time that they're the wrong color, they're changing at the same time every year, but the amount of time that they're right. the wrong color can change under different models of climate change. And so, you know, of course, we expect there to be a biological response to that. We don't think it's just a static trait that, you know, all the snowshoe hares will go extinct or something. But there is this... Um, question about how quickly can it change, how will it change, what mm -hmm. is the mechanism underlying that. And the details of the genetics really matter for understanding, you know, actually what, if they could change under really quick um, scenarios, you know, where suddenly there's no snow or something. That's really cool. cool. Um, that was, that, I feel like that conversation was very information dense and very interesting. So I... Yeah. I well, good, because uh, those aren't always the same thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, but uh, now I think that we are going to get to, so thank you for sharing that, yep. uh, really cool, and it's just always fascinating to hear about the practical everyday stuff that's going on all yep. over the world, and, and we're so lucky to have cool people studying cool things uh, really nearby uh, where we create SciShow, um, so thanks for sharing. Uh, but I, uh, we're going to get to now see an animal that actually does this, Yes. and it's summertime right now, yep. so this will not be a, a white animal, but it will, uh, it will be in just six months' time. Right. Uh, so let's, let's introduce let's our new friend. It. All right, we have returned. Uh, this is Cass. This is Jesse. Hi. <laughs> uh, Cass is the, 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 has the emotions I've, I've seen in every fox I've ever met, which is a, a mixture of extreme curiosity and, and anxiety. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well put, yes, yes. Um, just like, I want to know everything, but also, but also I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is exactly what almost all foxes exhibit. So Cass is uh, right now pretty white, actually. Whiter than I ex was expecting. Yeah, we saw him two and a half years ago. Yeah. So it was January when we saw him, and that is going to be the, the winter, the heavy. Right, where it's super, super Deep white. winter, exactly. Is, yes, that's some... all of his, his winter fur right there. And how soft is that? It's very soft. Yeah. You can make a sweater out of it. And also just leave it all around this room. It's floating for, everywhere. <laughs> for, the, for the other people who use this room to enjoy. So he started molting into or shedding into his summer for about uh, three months ago. And this is, he's four years old. And this is actually the first time he hasn't completely shed out. He still is retaining some of his winter fur on his tail there. Um, but all of this is his summer fur. That's actually the thinner, coarser mm -hmm. summer fur. And so it's kind of interesting to us. Mm. We haven't seen this silvering. He's usually a very dark gray fox huh. at this point. So they really do get a whole new coat every year. They mm -hmm. do, yeah. And this, this coat is, uh, is different than last year's. It is, different from the last uh. three years. Explain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know if it, you said you saw it before. So mm -hmm. sometimes it requires both the, the the light cue, but also the temperature cue, and you know, in, in environment in general. So food and stress and all those things can affect these traits. Mm -hmm. And so some in some species you can't actually get the trait to you know induce in a controlled environment. So I don't know why well he's not cha changing it could be an age related thing too mm -hmm. but yeah. um typically you know typically they change what's interesting that you're saying is molting you can see that he's he's got the um you know he's molting out the the insulative mm -hmm. under fur right yep. so this so the key is not just changing that. the color yep. but they also if you look at it, I don't know if the audience can get the, the profile, but you can actually see yeah. these really kind of bristly things sticking up. Those are called guard hairs, very oh. long. And then there's intermediate hairs that are called the on hairs usually, and those are what give visible color usually. Mm -hmm. And this is tip of those is what would make most things white or brown or whatever. 
Um, and then underneath you would have this dense wool that is you know, necessary for the other thing you have to deal with in the winter, which is being really, really cold. So these guys can live in incredibly cold environments, but it's a surprise. What time did he change? This year? Yeah. It was about three months ago. Okay. So April. So he started to change in April, and then in the winter it starts to turn in September? It's October. October. Yeah. So I think in, I think in the wild, they, I think it's shifted more September and May, so. Okay. Uh, that, that's my understanding, at least in, um, in Alaska. And so it could be that, that there's that there's an interaction between the light, yeah. but also the amount of temperature. Okay. I, I, it's not uh, getting as cold here yeah. in Montana. It was hot. So it, could be, it could be also, you know, we had pretty... I, we, we did had a, a very, very, very hot mild hot <laughs> winter. You think yeah. yeah, a mild winter and we got yeah. hot really fast. Yeah. But you'd think that would change it. I don't, and then it got yeah. cold again. And yeah, so it's, it's been, been a, it's been a, it's yeah, yeah. Been We've a had weird really year. weird weather this year, <laughs> just in general, which uh, can be explained by a different type of scientist, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not much. <laughs> not much to say about it, other than it was hot. So I was also yeah. interested because he's he's now four years old. They matured about two years old mm -hmm. in the wild, mm -hmm. um, but at two years old, he was very hormonal, uh -huh. intense, and at three years old, it, he was still kind of hormonal, yeah. um, but this year he is just really mellowed. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if if the hormones came into play with the with the expression of that change. Yeah. Well, the the traits the the hormones that drive the color change are also the same ones that interact with um, things like reproduction. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, so melatonin is the hormone that gets turned on when it's dark, and so that's why you take melatonin when you want to reset your sleep schedule, because mm -hmm. your body, you know, gets that cue when it's dark, melatonin's released. So the more dark you have, the more melatonin. Then there's this this threshold at some point where you start to trigger all these other things. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so like the molt and for a lot of species shutting down reproduction because you don't want to reproduce in the winter and changing a lot of other things like how you how you stay warm fat reserves and the types and how you store things and then in the spring the the melatonin gets downweighted and you start to get prolactin which is the other major hormone coming on that is drives a lot of you know does a lot of things but is pretty heavily involved in in reproduction so yeah reproduction what do you think, Cass? Cass? You're being you really think? good. Yeah, He's great. being amazing. I'm, we were a little nervous about this. We weren't sure how long he was going to be able to tolerate. You know, there's three people here. It's a new table, and there's there's not three people here. There's lots of people here, <laughs> um, but there's three close people and all these lights. I, we had him on like two yeah. and a half years ago, and he didn't last this long. Yeah. Um, He's doing quite well. He, he's panting because he's hot and he's a little yeah. bit nervous, but he's not showing me that he's really stressed out. I mean, yeah. he's, he's baseline right now. <laughs> Just, this is how foxes are. This off. is how he is. Yeah. We can talk about all their adaptations. So under their feet, um, their pads are not bare. Um, oh, really? They yeah, have, three. let's see, I don't know if we can actually see the pads of their feet. Yeah. Look at their back feet too. Oh, yeah. They the have, back, yeah. yeah. They're but covered like, in fur, and in the winter it's going to be even yeah. bigger. Oh, I'm oh. sorry, buddy. Oh, slippery table. I wasn't table. sure about that. Slippery table. Got it? Okay. Yeah, he's just relaxing. <laughs> yeah, so the... So, yeah, so that they have, in, especially in the and winter, they just sort of have like a mitten. It, it is. It's yeah. like a big pad underneath there, like and hobbits. it's... For <laughs> um, and it's for thermal... <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, it's for thermal regulation, but it's also for, this is amazing, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so much hair. So much hair. <laughs> but it's also for um, traction. So, I mean, it didn't work very well on this very smooth marble yeah. <laughs> table, but um, when he's running on ice and snow, it's also going to give him a lot of traction on that. Mm -hmm. It's like little snowshoes. Yeah, exactly. Almost and their feet like are very big. Snowshoe hairs. Snowshoe hairs have really furry feet. Out. So do the mm -hmm. hamsters. So the little hamsters that we study are native to Siberia, and they're, they're active, not nearly as cold as these guys go, but they can be active down to, you know, minus 30 degrees Celsius. And they have furry feet as well. So mm. they have like really furry little feet. And they're, they're very, they don't, when something's in a lot of cold places, they don't have long ears. They tend to yeah. you know, not have shorter, things sticking out. Shorter mm. ears, shorter Fuzzy nose, feet. shorter legs, mm -hmm. poofier tail. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and put him yeah. back. Okay. He's trying to show me he's, he's done. I'm done now. Uh, so we're now all covered in hair. I've just realized that I'm allergic to arctic fox. Oh, well that's a pretty cool thing to be allergic to. Right, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna run into that problem that often, but... Um, you have to write that on you the have to, You have to go away, because you're covered. <laughs> I'll go and shake off outside. 
Yeah. Um, but thanks for showing off Cass. This is yeah. Jessie of Animal Wonders. And if you want to check out her YouTube channel, it's youtube.com slash Animal Wonders Montana. This is Dr. Jeff Good of the University of Montana uh, at, at the Good Laboratory, which you run. Yeah, I named it. <laughs> you did a good job. Yeah. yeah, it's good. Thank you for watching. Thanks for uh, hanging out with us here on the SciShow Talk Show. If you like this, uh, we are happy to make it for you, but uh, we are only able to do it because of our supporters on Patreon. If you want to learn about that, you can go to patreon.com slash scishow. Do you guys have a Patreon? We do. Where's your Patreon? It, on Patreon, Animal Wonders Montana. <laughs> it's, so it's patreon.com slash Animal Wonders Montana. Yes. It's on Patreon, No, it's, it's Animal Wonders. It's just, just Animal okay, Wonders. Just animal. That's, yes. that's what I was asking. Uh, sorry. You answered the question. Uh, we'll put a link yeah. in the description. <laughs> uh, and if you want to keep watching this stuff, we appreciate that. Uh, and hopefully we will keep making you smarter. You can go to youtube.com slash scishow and subscribe.